welcome. I'm Octavius, and I must begin by thanking all of my subscribers. Uh, thank you so much for making this this uh, uh, possible. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video, share the video, comment, and keep your notification bell on. Thanks again. The, the tract of land we're talking about is basically Kip Mesorado, right? And how much land are we talking about? There have not been like the careful investigations that are, are required. And people have set up for, they say. So, you know, the, immediately after the, the agreement was signed, the um, accounts were put out that, um, oh, there were millions of acres or there were, you know, thousands of, of, of uh, acres or so many square miles. But no one had surveyed the, the, the land that was being bought. And from then until now, no one had really stopped to examine the issue that carefully. But that's what historians are supposed to do. So I know from my research that territories now included in Monrovia, Greater Monrovia, were actually purchased later, right, after this agreement was signed. The area known as Caldwell was purchased separately later by the ACS. Bushrod Island was not bought as an entity at one time. A portion of Bushrod Island was bought a few years later after this original agreement. And it was bought from a woman who was the head of that part of Bushrod Island. So, you know, what I then deduced was that given the fact that Bushrod Island was added later, Caldwell added later and so on, the, the, the land that was in question was actually what is now central Monrovia on the top of Kip Mesorado, that rocky area up there. And I'm saying I deduce that not just because these other tracts of land were bought later, but also because of the descriptions, uh, you know, written by people who were involved, you know, during, in those events. And they would talk about going up the hill from, um, from uh, Providence Island to put shelters, to build shelters up there for the people who were coming from Freetown. Yeah. So it was a small uh, a territory of land. Yeah, it was 100, about 140 acres to do. About 140 acres. And how much did they pay for that 140 acres that was the the initial piece of land that, that later became what we now know as Liberia? They paid... Uh, in with goods that were worth 300 US dollars. Now, this causes, uh, uh, again, a, a, a lot of confusion among people who don't understand that during that period, in the early 1800s, cash was useless in West Africa, right? You didn't have banking institutions. What are you gonna do with paper money or, you know, or any, any of those? So generally, trading was done on the basis of you give me so many goods uh, in exchange for these items. A barter system. It, yes, in effect, a barter system. And, uh, and that was common, very commonplace. So this was not unusual for a transaction to be done on that basis. So in this case, it was land in exchange for $300 worth of goods. The goods included guns, ammunition, you know, other things of substantial value, but um, you also find that there was tobacco and there was rum, you know, um, included among those items. And, and rum and tobacco were common uh, commodities that were valued along the West African coast. Uh, because you couldn't grow tobacco in West Africa at the time, and uh, rum was, you know, a luxury item, so to speak. You see, the thing that 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 amazes me uh, is how 
condescending many of our contemporaries are in regards to our ancestors. So I often hear people laugh, talk about how uh, they must have been naive or, you know, uh, how could these people have exchanged land for rum or tobacco? But you see, the reality is that those items, because they were luxury items, they were imported items, were valued quite highly. And the reason I say I, I just uh, um, am amazed at the condescension of some of our peers is because you go to Liberia today and someone wants to show you that, uh, you know, they are successful uh, and they, they, they are going to uh, provide you with the best available. Oftentimes, they're going to bring imported liquor. You follow me? Today, it might not be rum. It might be champagne or, or something along those lines. But the same commodities from abroad is what people are using to show that, oh, you know, I'm a person of substance. And uh, so, yeah, that they were buying the land with, with items that were of value to the local rulers. It, the other misunderstanding is that money value does not stay still. It does not stay unchanged. So when you take... Uh, quote regarding the value of something in 1821 you need to then check against the table of how currency values have changed over time and the tables show that $300 in 1831 would be worth $7,000 today the other issue is when people hear this they don't take that value and put it in context you know we just usually take it in isolation and then we make our judgments about it and we're quick to judge, say, look at how what they did. Oh, how could they have done this? But the reality is, if you took a similar piece of land in the United States at that time, you would have paid about a thousand, maybe two thousand dollars max. And it shows you the comparative value, right, um, that the local rulers were able to get for that place. Well, I want to thank you so much, and I hope we can do this a little bit more often. Dr. Carl Patrick Forrest, thank you so much today, sir. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm always honored.